I was the voice of God to people. So I was like the special anointed pastor. I pastored a church that, that I started in my living room at the time with just 10 other people, did it for 17 years. We had about 300 people at the peak. And I was also known at that time as a healing evangelist. So I would speak at churches Sunday morning to try to be more palatable. But Sunday night, I would be invited to people's church on a Sunday night to speak and do a healing service. And I'll never forget a lady that was brought down on, in a wheelchair. They told me what was wrong with her. And so we anointed her with oil and prayed. And on Tuesday, when I was getting ready to leave that church and come back here to Kansas City, the pastor called me and said, hey, so-and-so died. And I just remembered thinking her faith must have not been where it needed to be mm. to receive that healing, right? That's how you twist all that stuff. You truly believed you were healing people and they truly believed you had the potential to heal them. Yeah, I really believed that God was working through me to heal. I would often say that, you know, that I was just a conduit being used by God, but that I did have a special gift. I had a special connection with God where God felt comfortable, I guess, using me to deliver this healing power, okay. much like, you know, what we would say Jesus was doing. Mm. Of course, I don't believe any of this anymore, but that's what we would teach. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you'd like to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation. You can like, subscribe, leave those comments, those words of encouragement for our guests who are coming on and bravely sharing their story. It boosts the algorithm and makes everybody happy. So today's guest, he reached out to us through our Jot Forum. Remember, guys, you can always do that if you have a story that you'd like to tell. Uh, we have a guest application form in our about section where you can submit there. And we actually had a couple people requesting you in our comments as well. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yes, we did. Because one of the videos that our guest coming on has done is about the 7M Dancing with the Devil cult, and we'll get into that. But... He is a self-proclaimed cult leader in the sense that he was a pastor over evangelical and Pentecostal churches and has now denounced all of that. And so we're going to get from the horse's mouth what that's <laughs> all about. We're going to talk about the healing sessions. We're going to talk, talk about speaking in tongues and what he thinks of all of that now. So thank you so much for joining us, Timmy Gibson. Yeah, thank you for having <laughs> me. I appreciate it. That's actually how I found out about you is that the video that I did on the Dancing for the Devil docu-series on Netflix, I had four or five comments come in that I should contact you guys. Oh, nice. And so I was like, okay, I'll reach out to them and see what <laughs> happens. And so I went back later and commented under and said, hey, we're in discussion. And everybody's like, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So we're yeah. going to get into that side of your story, obviously, towards the end. But just as like a little, this is what we're going to get to tidbit it's because you recognize that you were cult adjacent or you had done similar things because of watching Robert Shin on the documentary and saying, I've said those exact same things, right? Yeah. I mean, I was, I was vaguely aware of, of how culty the Pentecostal charismatic health, wealth gospel that I was a part of was. And yes, when I watched that docuseries, it just became fully aware that I became fully aware, like, oh my gosh, I, I remember teaching that kind of stuff and saying some of those same things that I heard on that docu-series. And so that's what then launched me into sharing, beginning now, literally just now, going public with my story. So yeah, which is so interesting. And for those who are wondering, we have been getting a lot of comments like cover the 7M documentary. We are working on it. We're trying to get with the publicity team to get people from the documentary on the show. So it's in the works. Oh, very cool. Yeah, we're, we're doing our best. Um, okay, so back to your story. I think we need to know where you came from and how everything culminated into who you became today. So let's talk about your parents' back background and your background growing up. Sure. Yeah. Grew up in church. Uh, my mom was a, a vocalist in the choir and played church piano. 
in the Assembly of the God Pentecostal Church here in Kansas City. There were some marriages and divorces. My biological father since passed, but then she remarried the son of a Baptist preacher. And so uh, when they got married, I was six years old. And from that point, I was in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, camp meetings, revivals and potlucks. And I mean, you name it, I was there just all my life. And after graduating high school, I went off to seminary, uh, Bible college. And the first Bible college that I went to was an Assembly of God Bible college called Central Bible College. It's now since gone under. But I was actually kicked out of the Bible college after about a year and a half for drinking a wine cooler. Wow. <laughs> and it was a it, it was a traumatic experience. It's, that's a whole story in and of itself. But it was extremely conservative. I mean, they they were teaching things in the Bible college like dinosaur bones were created by the devil. You know, the earth is 6,000 years old. Mm. Um, I had to wear a suit to class, had to have short hair, which I never liked, but I had to have really short hair. And it was just, it couldn't watch TV, no movies, no dancing, couldn't play pool. Very, very, very conservative, fundamental. I've never heard the pool thing before. Why couldn't you play pool? Just because of the, the, typically the pool was in the bar or in the clubs. Uh, and so, yeah, you weren't allowed to darken the doors of anything like that. It was just super, super strict. In fact, I would go to a restaurant to pick up and do carry out. And I wouldn't even go over to the bar counter when they would say, go to the bar counter and pick up your order. I was like, no, I'll give you my credit card and you can go over there for me. Cause I can't, I can't be in that. By the, I can't even be by that bar. That's so interesting. <laughs> okay, I want to dive into the mentality of that. The mentality of not wanting to go to the bar because of the appearance of evil, I think you mentioned on our phone call. Was that something that you truly believed, like you couldn't even dip a toe into the pool of sin and that was something that was like too tempting, I don't even want to go next to the bar? Absolutely. It wasn't necessarily tempting for me. I grew up in a non-drinking family. And so I, I had never, I mean, I was a typical teenager and, you know, drank, but it really wasn't a temptation for me. It was more the avoiding the very appearance of evil. It was really more about if someone saw me. Oh, reputation. Yes. Yeah. They say your reputation is everything. And so you don't want to be seen near uh, a bar or near any kind of establishment like that. And so like, yeah, if you were ever in a social setting and someone said, Hey, can you hold my beer for a second? I'm going to go to the bathroom. Absolutely not. It's mm. like, no, I, I can't hold your beer. I can't. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that sounds crazy now, it, you know, but back then it just seemed like this was me being separate from the world. You know, you're in the world, but don't be of it. Yeah. And so I was really trying to, yeah, trying to separate myself from anything that could reflect bad on me. No, that makes sense. So growing up in the mainstream Mormon church, if I had a Starbucks cup, even if there was hot chocolate in it, if someone saw it, they would be like, she's drinking coffee, wow. Like she's just right in the open with her coffee cup. <laughs> yeah. So same type of thing. And I also think a lot of that has to do with the environment of growing up in Utah, where it's just this pressure cooker of Mormons and everyone's judging everyone. So. Yeah. Within that, what I found for me is it made me a super judgy person because you're taught to discern in huge air quotes of like who you should be around. And so did you find that that also made you a very judgmental person against other people? Oh, 100%. I don't think there was a more judgy person than me. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I mean, I judged anyone. If you didn't go to church, I judged you. If you definitely didn't go to my church, I judged you. We judged other churches just because it, they weren't us. I mean, that it was very, that's one of my problems with uh, at least the group that I was a part of is it's such an us and them mentality. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the saved and the unsaved. It's the godly and the lost, you know? It, it, and so, yeah, it's just not a healthy environment, but when you're in it, you know, it's all, you know, I mean, it just seems like this is your, your superior because you're connected to God. You know, and so you're really trying to separate yourself from the devil mm. and, and his kingdom and his work. You know, again, it, well, even when I'm saying it, I'm like, wow, this sounds so crazy now. But then it made all the sense in the world. 
No, it makes sense, especially the way that you grew up in that environment. It's just your reality. And that's what I try to tell people when they're like, how could you fall for something like that? It's like, well, when you grow up your whole life living a certain way, you just think that's how the world works and everyone else is doing it wrong. <laughs> And yeah. So, yeah. And so you yeah. really have no baseline or understanding of there could be another way where you don't put other people down because they're having a coffee cup in their hand, you know? Right. Right. Let's get into the Bible college a little bit. So what was your experience? Why did you want to go to Bible college? Did you feel like this was a calling of yours? Yep, I did. I felt like it was a calling and I really felt like this is what God wanted me to do and that I was, you know, super special and had a gift and I was anointed. And I even, that was my first tattoo that I ever got was on my chest and it was a heart and it said anointed, oddly enough, spelled wrong. Oh no. And yeah. <laughs> so just, you know, when I think of the word anointed, you think of appointed, A-P-P, -P, right? And so I told the tattoo artist A N N, and this is you know back in the oh, '80s. So this right. is before this is before you could like Google it oh, and no. quickly find out. And so I'll never forget. I got it, got the tattoo, and it wasn't too long that I showed it to someone, and they go, uh, "I think that's spelled wrong." And I'm like, "No, it's not." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so anyway, it was kind of a big joke. It's like, yeah, you're a you're anointed, spelled wrong. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's actually a pretty radical thing for you to do to get a tattoo when you're very Christian. Very. I got ridiculed a lot in Bible college about it and, and was told that I always had to keep it covered. So when you're in Bible college, you're completely invested. You feel like I am supposed to be here. I am God's chosen. And people are ridiculing you for being a little bit more fringe. But you still know like nope, I am meant to do God's work and become a pastor. Yeah, I definitely had this imposter kind of feeling like I didn't, you know, I didn't really fit the mold mm -hmm. because I was always pretty contemporary somewhat, right? I mean, I was definitely, you know, had the longer hair before I went to Bible college and had the tattoo and I tried to, back then, tried to dress cool. Uh, so I was, I was a little trendy back then, a little bit edgy. So I found myself just out of place. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like I really fit in. But, you know, you keep going, you keep listening, you keep submitting to the teaching and, and you just end up buying in and thinking, hey, I'm just a little bit edgy. You know, I'm a rebel, uh, but yet God wants to use me. Yeah. yeah. So that's interesting because usually people who do totally fit the mold are like, obviously, this is my calling, but you were kind of on the edge of it. So do you feel like maybe those feelings came from your parents pushing you that direction? Oh, yeah, most assuredly. It, it was definitely in the culture of the church that I grew up in that the highest call would be to become a pastor, mm. you know, a, a leader in the in the church. I mean, it was really equated to a, a bigger role than even being the president of the United States. Wow. You know what I mean? Like it, it was viewed as if you become a pastor, you're, you're at the top of, of what is, what really matters in this world. You know, like what really matters is winning people to Christ. I mean, that's what I believe that wholeheartedly then. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of pride that went in to this decision to follow the call of God that I felt like I had in my life. Yeah, that makes sense. Your mom grew up Pentecostal and your dad was Baptist or your um, stepdad was Baptist. So yeah. where did you fall? Did you grow up in the Pentecostal churches? Yeah, yeah, we were in a Pentecostal church, the Assemblies of God church. Um, so yeah, there was all the wild stuff that goes along with that. Let's talk about that. <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> yeah, it was wild. You know, I, I, again, when you're in it, it seems normal. So like speaking in tongues, seeing people slain in the spirit, seeing people sobbing and or, or snaking down the aisle or flip flopping around up at the front of the church is weird. Again, as weird as that sounds <laughs> to say, it was normal and it didn't really become abnormal to me or strange until high school. And we had a Sunday where they really encouraged you to, to bring, you know, bring your friends to, to church. 
<laughs> and I brought a few of my friends that had never been to church before. And, you know, so it was already a little weird anyway. Yeah. But you add, you add, you know, you add in Aunt Margaret over there speaking in tongues and then someone else falling out on the floor and, and convulsing. And, you know, again, I'm thinking, I mean, this is church. And my friends were just like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> they were just so shocked by this this behavior that, that I found to be, this is church. Like, this is what I'm used to. This, this is normal. Isn't it funny when you have to either explain your beliefs or like you said, take someone to church, all of a sudden you're seeing it through their eyes and then you kind of recognize the oddity. So I remember trying to explain Mormonism to someone once I left Utah and someone was like, oh, so tell me about Mormonism. And I was so pumped. I'm like, okay, so there are these plates and then this angel came down and then Joseph Smith had to like translate them with a rock. And then um, it's like this other testament of Jesus. And they're like, wow, what happened to the plates? I'm like, well, they got taken back to heaven, so we don't have them now. <laughs> but like, when you have to actually explain it, you're like, oh, this sounds weird because you can see the gears turning in their head yeah. like really and then you go well okay that's a little weird so i know that feeling and see now to me like as a if went back in the old day like had you told me that i would have felt like that's weird yeah that's that's what the other weird thing is about the judgment is i would judge i went to a catholic mass one time with one of my friends and i just couldn't stop judging it mm -hmm. you know it was just it, it was fake. It was all form and it was all this. And, you know, the priest is single, never been married. Blah, 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 blah. So it was like anything other than what I was a part of was off and weird and not, not, not God. Yeah. And what I was involved in was the true, the true thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's <laughs> the thing. No one can ever see it. Until you take the goggles off, it's it's almost impossible to recognize that your crazy is crazy, but other people's crazy is obviously crazy, and we're not going to do that. Like, that's wild, but my thing. Right. And then I remember thinking, like, wow, I'm so lucky to be born into the one true church. What are the odds? <laughs> it's like every single yeah. person is thinking the same thing. Like, wow, I'm so lucky to be in the right one. So after Bible college, what happened? So after Bible college, uh, I began to travel around as an evangelist and speaking, which is just speaking from church to church to church all around uh, the country. Mm -hmm. And finally, and I was involved in, I became a student pastor, a youth pastor and different things at churches that were very culty, uh, very culty, very man of God, uh, very curious. And, and even for me, I had those experiences and I thought, this seems a little odd. I was traveling around speaking in different churches and even got in, became a youth pastor. And I was employed at a couple different churches that definitely had some culty vibes that, that was not completely new to me, but a little bit new to me. Just kind of that man of God, you know, touch not God's anointed, meaning the pastor. You can't talk bad about the pastor. You can't question the pastor. You know, you can't, you know, they were, they were almost even separate from the staff. Like the pastor was so elevated that there was just, there was no accountability. You know, he was the man of God. He was the person that God put in charge. Mm -hmm. And so working in that environment, you know, that was a little odd. I remember having some issues thinking, this seems weird that you can't question the pastor and you can't ask questions. This seems odd. Anyway, so then, but then you get, again, you get starting to get familiar with it. Like, this is the way it is. This is how it is. And so then in 2002, I moved back to Kansas City, which is where I'm from, and started uh, my own church. And that's then where, the, for the next 17, 18 years, I pastored a church that, that I started in my living room at the time. Oh, wow. Which is... 10 other people, 10 other uh, people joined me and boom, we started a church and did it for 17 years. We had about 300 people at the peak, 300 people coming. And by the end, you know, I had dropped the Pentecostal flair. Like we weren't doing the tongues and 
the falling out and flailing and snaking down the aisle. We were trying to be, I forget what they call it, but kind of that cool church that's, yeah, trying to be real progressive. And honestly, my, I, I would say this then. I was like, listen, it's okay to be a Christian. Just don't be weird about it. <laughs> And you so, say that. you know, yeah, yeah, I would say that from the, from the front, just saying, Hey, listen, let's, let's not be so weird so we can actually do what God's called us to do, which is reach all these lost people. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Well, we obviously have to get to the part where you did do the speaking in tongues and the healing sessions and talk about oh, what yeah. that was like from your point of view. Well, okay. First, you started a church in your living room, so you clearly have the charisma. I mean, you're a very charismatic guy. So oh, I could you. see people being like, yeah, let's follow Timmy. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. So was this a plan all along of like, okay, I'm just going to recruit as many people as possible, or did they just kind of flock to you because of your charismatic nature? Yeah. You know, it, I definitely called some other people that I knew that I had known over the years, and, you know, where I'd worked at other churches or been an attendee in churches. And so I just reached out to some people and said, hey, I'm going to start a church. Do you want to be a part of it? And then after that, it was just invite your friends, invite your friends, invite your friends and flyers. And then we just started really marketing ourselves as, uh, you know, a new church in town that has kind of a, you know, a wild lead pastor that has some tattoos and and that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, it just started to really grow. We were growing really up and to the right. Uh, I think we reached 100 people at the end of our first year. And then I think second and third year it was 200 and then 300. And there were services that we had, you know, five and 600 people show up on a Sunday, especially, you know, Easter, Christmas, yeah. you know, the typical the typical days, but where the tongues came in is that, I mean, I grew up that way. Mm -hmm. So in Bible college, I was also teaching a, a large Sunday school class and, you know, I would teach on speaking in tongues and I would even speak in tongues in front of the whole group, you know, teaching them how to speak in tongues and explaining what it, what it meant, you know, what, what we as Pentecostals believed. What does that look like? How are you teaching people to speak in tongues? You know, you, this is going to seem so weird, but I'll tell you, you would basically tell people just let go of your mind, like just let go and just let your tongue loose is what we would say. And so we would just teach people like say, la, 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 and just say, la, 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 just start letting your tongue just say stuff. And so different people, their tongues obviously sounded different because everybody's just doing whatever they think is letting their self go with this godly language, you know, this language that is directly connected to God. What we used to teach is, is that when you're praying in tongues, you're bypassing your thoughts. So it's your spirit directly communicating to God. So there's no interference of, of your mind. You're, you're, you're clearly Love connected it. to God and praying these ultimate truths. And it's, yes, yeah, very curious, you know, and then we do tongues and interpretation. So you speak in tongues and then I'll interpret. And, and so I would interpret people's tongues clearly, obviously. I was just making up quoting scripture or saying good things, you know. Uh, like God wants me to tell you that he's got a plan for you and a, uh -huh. a purpose for you and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And he's going to get you out of this trouble. And, you know, whatever I can say that was, again, I was just saying encouraging things that sounded like, okay, this is probably what God was wanting me to say to them. And that's what I would do. You know, yeah. I would just tell them good things. So are you getting these intuitive hits or are you just like straight up making them up? I mean, I, and I thought at the time they were intuitive hits. Um, just like right now, you could say, Timmy, make up a song. I'm going to play some music. You sing a song. Yeah. I could totally, I could totally do it just because I'm, I don't know what that is. I just can, you know, um, maybe it's self confidence. <laughs> maybe it's my ego. <laughs> For whatever reason though, like I could s start singing a song and make it up. So for me, it was much the same, except that I attributed it to God. You know, I said that this is what God is telling me to tell you. And so things were coming into my mind and I just started speaking them. But, you know, now I know it was just myself speaking to myself. You know, it's that, it's that inner dialogue, you know, when you're driving down the road and you just, 
feel like, you know, I should turn here. I should go that it's just my inner voice talking to myself. But when you're a Pentecostal specifically, when you're a Pentecostal Christian, that voice is God. Yeah. Unless, unless it's telling you to do something bad, you know, like have sex before marriage. That's the devil. That's the devil. Yeah. So I think there's something here and it's interesting. It's basically confirmation bias, right? Because based on how you grew up, that's how you view the world through that lens. So if you grew up in mystical circles, maybe it's your intuition or a spirit guide telling you things. If you grew up in conservative Christian, it's God telling you things. Or in Mormonism, it's the Holy Ghost telling you things. So I'm not one to say that nothing exists outside of our own mind, because maybe there is something that's impressing upon us. But I think it's important to note that when you're using that to manipulate or tell people what their life is or like in some way affect their life that could potentially be negative, I think that's tricky. I think yeah. I think if you want to use your own intuition and your own intuitive hits or whatever it is coming through for yourself, then great, do you. Um, sure. But I just find it really interesting with the speaking in tongues thing and you interpreting because I'm sure it gave you a sense of empowerment of like, wow, I'm really helping these people or wow, I really have God speaking through me because I would imagine that after doing that and teaching a class and getting that confirmation and, and hearing things from people, maybe you did touch their lives in a certain way, it would probably reinforce that belief that you did have this connection and you were doing the right thing in your mind. Yeah. In my mind, I was doing the right thing. And I really did feel like I was hearing from God. And like you, you know, I, I call myself an agnostic because I, you know, I don't know, you know, what, what could be out there. Now, I definitely don't believe in the Bible, God, but I believe that who knows, there's maybe there's something I don't know. But then for me, it was doing good. And yeah, you know, when I first left religion and I kind of came out on Facebook saying that I'm no longer a Christian, a lot of people from my pastoral days who are still Christian, you know, sent me kind of sad notes saying, I'm, I'm so sad and disappointed. You know, you, you helped me, uh, follow God. You helped me put mm. God back in my life or, you know, you helped me recover from a breakup or, or whatever, you know, and, and it touched my heart because that was my intent. I was very sincere, clearly very sincerely wrong. Um, but I was very sincere in what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it, it hasn't become clear to me until the last few years, just how toxic it, it, it was really to, for myself and, and for those that I was teaching, um, but you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful now that I'm aware and that my eyes have been opened. Um, but you know, some of the people have been very broken and sad that I've left the faith because now, you know, now I'm going to hell and yeah. I'm working for the devil. <laughs> clearly working for the devil. <laughs> yeah, clearly I'm working for the devil. Yeah. Yeah, which is interesting because when you have someone that you put up on a pedestal like that, and they did put you on a pedestal for good reason, you're the pastor, speaking for God. And so when someone of God falls, then in their mind, obviously he's being controlled by Satan or demons and they go to this negative, deceived. Thing, yeah, deceived, or did he ever really have a testimony to begin with and all of those That's things. That's what I hear most of the time. Yeah, I hate that. It's that I apparently never really was really, I never really read the Bible or really understood it. And I'm just like, yeah, no, that that's like telling an NFL, a former NFL football player that you were never a real football player <laughs> because you're not a football player now. Yeah. Like that just seems so curious to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clearly you were putting everything into this ministry, having that many people following you and coming to church and listening to you. So let's talk about the uncomfy stuff, which is ways in which you know that maybe you are manipulating or controlling the narrative to get what you wanted. Yeah, definitely when it came to twisting the Bible about money, you know, really getting people to give to the church. Again, at the time, I thought they were giving to God, you know, to give to the church is to give to God, to give to the man of God is to also give to God. And when you give to the church and give to God and give to the man of God, 
you know, you're, you're getting blessings, if not here in eternity, you know, which it, I believe now is a total lie. It's not true. But at the time, I thought that was true, that blessing me, the man of God, or blessing the church was a way and a, a avenue for those in the church to be blessed by God, mm. you know, and they clearly also believed it. You know, they, they believed uh, in honoring the man of God or giving to the man of God was was a way that they could be blessed. I mean, you see this all the time with TV evangelists. You know, like this is how you get blessed. God will return to you tenfold mm -hmm. and, you know, press down, shaken together and running over like all these Bible verses that that we would use back in the day to get people to give and contribute financially and volunteer. You know, some people, I, you know, I feel bad about it now, but getting people to volunteer, some people would volunteer 10, 15, 20 hours a week of their time to the church. And there was no, like, you're, you're storing up treasure in heaven is what I would tell them. Like everything you're doing here on earth, you're just storing up treasures in heaven. You're, you're, you're stocking up in your mansion in heaven, or you're putting crowns in your, or you're jewels putting jewels in, in your crown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and again, I really believed it and earnestly thought that that's what was going on. And of course, now, you know, I realized that, oh my goodness, that's just, a farce. Cause you know, as a pastor, some of the brokest people were the people that were giving, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't getting any kind of blessing whatsoever. The blessing was all at the top. You know, the, the people in the church were making huge sacrifices, um, to, to give and to volunteer to support the church and the man of God and the staff. So it was very curious. Yeah. Did you ever feel guilty when you saw these people who didn't have a lot of money tithing to you and were, how, I mean, how were you directly benefited? How did the money system work? Yeah, the money system. I mean, I did have, you know, trustees and people that, that watched over the finances of the church. So there wasn't like I was living high on the hog at, at this point. But, you know, I remember one time in particular, there was a young, young man, very on fire for God. And he himself wanted to go into ministry. And I think he probably is at this point. I've lost touch. But he donated his car uh, to, like, gave his car to a young family that that needed a car. Even to this day, it, it was an act of charity and it was an act of goodwill and good faith. But this young man ended up not having a car for almost a year, struggling financially, mm. had to ride his bike or walk to work and do different things. So. You know, he made this sacrifice thinking that, you know, doing this gesture would bless him on the back end. And, and really, I saw it really more hurt him. Yeah. You know, he was motivated like, Hey, I'm going to give this car because God will bless me. Like I'll give this whatever kind of car it was. And, and God's going to bless me with a better, newer car mm. as a result. And I saw a lot of that in Bible college, a lot of that kind of stuff going on where people were just giving hand over fist and sacrificing their own financial security and their own blessing by giving to the church. And, and, you know, and I would see the church and the pastors, you know, driving their $150,000 premium car, luxury cars and private parking area for the pastor and his family. And, you know, it was very, very, odd now but again as even when i was in this environment i wanted to aspire to that mm. like that i was like that's going to be me like i'm going to have a green room at my church where you know servants will come and serve me in the green room because i'm the man of god you know and luckily i got out just before that really started to really take off but i was seeing signs of it you know people were very honoring to me you know very loving and kind to me and, and giving me gifts, always giving gifts to me. And, and so it was, I could see that it was feeding me. I mean, it made me feel like I am special, <laughs> you know, like God was right. I am special and he's got a special purpose for me. And, and yeah, it just got to, it gets to your head. It got to my head for sure. And, you know, very grateful now that, that, 
it started unwinding for me and becoming clear that something's off with all of this. Yeah. Let's talk about other ways that you benefited as the pastor and the ways in which you can recognize now that maybe were excessive. Yeah, I think for me, mainly when I think about how I was really just honored and and treated as so special above anyone else, right? Like it, I was the man of God. So I was like the special anointed pastor. I was the voice of God to people uh, many times. Financially, it wasn't excessive only because, and I'm not, if it was excessive, I would say so. I mean, it, it, it then I was paid the salary of what most pastors were paid in a church our size. But when I would go and speak at other churches, you know, they would take up offerings for me as the special guest speaker. And that is where you would really make some good money. Like you would go do a, a Sunday morning service and walk away with 10 grand. What? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, or it was, it was wild. Um, and I, I didn't get a chance to do this, but you know, I, I needed to write a book. I'm like, I'm going to write a book. So when I'm traveling to this churches, you know, I'll collect the speaking gift and I'll sell books after and sign my autograph. And I mean, there, there was definitely, these things were in my mind as I was moving up and becoming more popular ish, mm -hmm. you know, very, very small world, but becoming popular in that world. Because at the time my church was considered a very fast growing church in, in the Pentecostal group that I was in. And so there were other pastors calling me saying, Hey, you know, what are you doing? Your church has grown to 300 people in just a matter of a couple of years. And can you come teach our church and talk to our staff about what you're doing? And what were you doing? I think just pushing the envelope and, and, you know, I have been told by many people, I have a very charismatic personality and, and, you know, part of it was we had a great band, our band, our worship. Nice. Our, yeah. I mean, we just had some really, good musicians. And we even started like opening up the service with Bon Jovi, you know, like we <laughs> would, yeah, like, uh, on a yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was one of our main ones, nice. you know? So when I say edgy, we were really starting to push the envelope. I did a thing called beer in the Bible where I would, cause you know, obviously I'd worked through my fear of the, I was going to say, yeah. And we would rent out bar rooms and, get pitchers of beer and and I would stand in there with my bible teaching you know while I'm sipping on a a beer you know on a cold one and then I would teach um so yeah we were doing a lot of back then what seemed to be super edgy but again it was only edgy for me and my group because we were evangelical pentecostal no drinking no cussing no premarital sex no I mean there were all these rules that we were following, but then we were starting to say, okay, <laughs> you can, you can be a Christian and smoke cigars. You can be a Christian and, and, you know, drink a beer. So I was really trying to, again, this was our idea of outreach. Like this is how we can get our church members to reach out to their lost friends and family uh -huh. because, hey, don't worry, we're not going to do the tongues we're not thing the weird on ones. a Sunday morning. Yeah, we're not the weird ones. Now, we would get weird in private, like when we would have closed invite-only <laughs> type Bible studies. Well, yeah, then we could say and do whatever because we were all in-group people. Interesting. So we could, we could do the tongues. We could do all that. But our Sunday morning started to become very hip, you know, doing like you like literally that was one of the songs we would do by Bon Jovi or we would do an old 80s rock tune, you know, make sure the lyrics were clean <laughs> or we would alter we would alter, you know, alter the lyrics just enough to where you knew what the song was, but we took out anything that wasn't appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So my question then, because. This is so interesting. There are people, and we see it in the comments sometimes too, where people are like, okay, but they're from an extreme Pentecostal church. Not my church. I come from the cool one, right? But right. <laughs> what just clicked in my head though is you're the one making the allowances and you're the one telling everyone that's okay. 
Yep. So in reality, you're like the gatekeeper. It's still cultish. Yeah, it's still well, cultish. Because, because if they were to follow the traditional Pentecostal ways, they would be speaking in tongues and slithering down the aisle. And so <laughs> would you, in a sense, looking back, does it seem like maybe you were keeping them from the true gospel or the true ways or whatever because you're giving them those special allowances? But really, it's just at the end of the day, a guy being like, let's just not be weird. Yeah, it does. And I did have, again, we had to really make sure to to get the buy-in from the core members who were really financially supporting the whole church. Because you know a new person isn't going to give to the church, right? Uh-huh. They don't believe in that yet. They haven't been indoctrinated. Like that's how you get blessed by the Lord is by giving to the church. But the inner circle, they understood it and, and they were contributing and they were the financial underwriters of what our church was doing. So how I would sell it was, Hey, listen, this is how we're going to reach the lost. We can't be weird and do the tongues thing. They're not going to come. All we're going to do is get other Pentecostal people that are already cool with that. And we don't want to quote unquote steal from another church. We want lost people. Like we want, we want new people in our cult. Uh-huh. So we have to present ourselves as normal and cool and not so weird so that we can get them in. And once they're warmed up and we say, Hey, listen, see, we're not weird. And then as they get to buy in more, then you would invite them to these more closed door meetings where tongues is happening. You know, we're laying hands on sick people and asking God to heal them and things like that. Mm -hmm. But man, we never would invite an outsider to that stuff because we just knew it would be weird for them. So funny because you know that it's culty. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's like Mormonism where it's like, come to church and it's so just like a little lamb. It's so serene and pure and cute. It's kind (laughs) of cute, right? Yeah. And then you get to the temple and you're like, what the fuck? (laughs) <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> what the hell? Well, we can't. We can't tell everyone what's going on in the temple, or no one will show up to the church on Sunday. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is exactly what our philosophy was. And, you know, again, now looking back, it's still very culty. And in fact, I get comments on my YouTube now. Even I feel as palatable as I am, and, and as gracious I am is towards those who are still Christian. I mean, that's not my thing. I'm not a Christian. I still have Christians who will attack me for walking away. And and in my mind, I'm thinking, do you realize how culty that is? How you're acting towards me because I walked away from what you believe Mm -hmm. to be true. And, and, and even that slight to me feels cultish. Yeah. You know, that feels like, wow, they've, they've bought into that cult of Christianity. And that's why they're attacking me and having trouble with where I'm at because it's not where they are. Exactly. I was going to say, I feel like that's what happens when you threaten their belief system and they feel like you're attacking them personally, even though it has nothing to do with them. Your existence right. literally has nothing to do with them and their beliefs. But because you are comfortable without the belief system, they don't even want to think about the idea that there might be comfort outside of their beliefs because that means they may have to question themselves and they may have to deconstruct and that's not anything that they want to do. So it's easier to attack and demonize the people who have left and are living their best lives instead of just accepting those for their own beliefs. Yeah. Anybody I think that knows me, I, you know, I lost a lot of friends, as you can imagine. But people that know me have even said, wow, you're like a better person. <laughs> like you're a better human now that you're not a Christian, not, not religious. Isn't that and interesting? It is interesting. And for myself, I, I feel like a better person. Like I really, really, for once in my life feel this might sound weird, but I feel very integrated, mm-hmm. like who I want to be and who I am matches up. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I was living that life, I always felt like, you know, my righteousness was as filthy rags. You know, I, I could never measure up to what I thought I was supposed to be. And it wasn't until I walked away that it just became so clear to me that I am who I am. And yeah. I have, I don't have to, I don't have to, all the shame and the guilt and the judgment. And then I could also love other people and accept them for who they are. And so now when I, 
you know, when I see people different than me, it, I, I'm just neutral. I'm like, oh, like, okay. You know, whereas before I'd be like, oh, look at that, that guy, he's wearing lipstick or his nails are painted or he's wearing earrings or whatever. I mean, you name it, I, I, any kind of judgment. Yeah. And, and now it's like, no, <laughs> this is a cool, colorful world. People are different. People have different ways of being and that's okay. And there's no sin in that. It's just part of, I mean, look at all the different, just animals in the world, all the different beautiful, colorful kinds of creatures on the world. We're no different, you know, just everybody's different doing their own thing. And I've become a lot more open uh, as a result of this journey, for sure. Dare I say more Christ-like. <laughs> exactly. I had a friend say to me, he goes, he goes, can I say this? Like, you're more Christian than you were when you were a Christian. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm not sure what that means because, you know, what I think a Christian is, is this, yeah. this, and this. But I understood what he meant is that it, it's not, it, here's what they assume. And I had a lot of friends assume this, that Timmy must be going off into a life of sin. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to be, he's using meth and he's in a, he's living in a van down by the river. And I think as they saw my life, they were like, He's not living in a van down by the river, which actually that'd be kind of cool in this day and age. But, you know, he's he's not he's hasn't thrown his life away. He's doing well, like and it just it causes the, their brain to tilt and they can't really understand how is that possible that you left Christianity and, and, and your life didn't go into shambles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's just curious. That's a, and I remember thinking that. I, I remember when people would leave my church, and I would hear that they're not going to church anymore. I'm like, the devil got them. The devil's blinded so them. So that's the thing, Timmy. Did you preach that if you were to leave, then you would fall into sin and you would be led by the yep. devil? So of course, people are like, well, Timmy, he's just doing what yeah. he said would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's, that's one of the regret, regretful teachings that I would teach is that if you were in our church, that you were under our covering and that there was a special blessing that resided at our church. Mm. And if you were in our church and participating in the church, there was a special blessing for you and protection and that's just so twisted, you know, so twisted that, yeah, that's one of those things that I look back on. I'm just like, oh, brother, Timmy, you were just so blinded to believe. And in fact, I would say that I would say this. I would say if you'll give to our church, God will protect you from the devil's attacks, mm. you know, cause the devil, the devil's out to get you, you know, the devil's out to get you, which is weird. Cause like the devil's out to get you. God's out to test you. It's like, you can't win on either side. And so I taught that if you gave to the church and, and were under our covering, you and your family would be protected. There'd be a special protection on you by doing that. And that's sad. You know, I look back on that. That's just so sad. And not true, clearly. So I have to ask, because I'm sure people are wondering, was there a part of you, I know that a part of you believed it, but was there also a part of you that thought, I don't want anyone to leave or not tithe because it would affect my paycheck? Ish, ish. Because I was also so brainwashed myself that I really believed that God was my source. You know, like I believed that it, it wasn't people, even though it was, but it wasn't people. It was ultimately God. In other words, God's if I stayed true, money. right, like God was the one that was so when a family would leave and this happened, families that I knew were contributors to the church would leave. I remember I would get on my knees and I would say, God, I'm, you know, we're being faithful to you. We're preaching your message. We're winning the lost. We're saving people from the devil you know, bring more people into the church to, to help us, you know, grow financially and grow in every way. Mm -hmm. So yes, there were times when families would leave and I was like, Oh shoot, you know, like they were big contributors to the church. But again, my faith was so deep and I was so certain that God was watching out for us. And if we could keep doing the work of God, God would provide. Yeah. That makes sense. 
Let's talk about yeah. those healing sessions. Did they yeah. work? Did you heal people, Timmy? Yeah. So not literally, but <laughs> I, I think it's just the law of averages, right? It, it, some people can get healed of things. You know, people will have cancer and then they'll do chemotherapy, but, you know, it, as well as we prayed for them. And so the testimony would be, you know, John had cancer and we prayed for him and he's healed now. Well, yeah, he also was going to the doctor yeah. and, and doing radiation and chemotherapy, which I'm sure that kind of helped, but what really helped was, was God. Mm. And you just would focus on that. You wouldn't talk about the times you prayed and it didn't work. And I'm saying this only because I remember one time as I was traveling around as a, as an evangelist, and I was also known at that time as a healing evangelist. So I would speak at churches on a Sunday night, because that's when you do the healing services, because Sunday morning, you try to be more palatable. But Sunday night, I would be invited to people's church on a Sunday night to speak and do a healing service. And I'll never forget a lady that was brought down on, in a wheelchair. And she had, I can't remember what was wrong with her at this point, but they, they told me what was wrong with her. And so we anointed her with oil and prayed and, and literally, I kid you not. And this is, I mean, I say this, it's just one of the stories. It's sad now, but, and I was there for like a three day revival, meaning I was teaching on Sunday night. And then Monday night and Tuesday night, it was a three-day revival. Prayed for her on Sunday. On Tuesday, when I was getting ready to leave that church and come back here to Kansas City, the pastor had called me and said, hey, so-and-so died. <gasps> and and I just remembered thinking, well, you know, her faith must have not been where it needed to be mm. to receive that healing, right? That's how you twist all that yeah. stuff is you say, well, wasn't their my fault. faith. Right. Wasn't my fault. But their faith didn't connect with my faith. Something in them blocked the healing power that was definitely present when we prayed for them. Or we would say things like, well, God must have needed her in heaven. And so right. he went ahead and, and gave her the ultimate healing, which is took her to heaven. So there's no more pain, no more death, no more crying, no more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, there, it, no matter what happened, you could always spin it to make it make sense in the already weird way of making sense of the things that we were teaching. You truly believed you were healing people and they truly believed you had the potential to heal them. Yeah, I really believed that God was working through me to heal. I would often say that, you know, that I was just a conduit. I was just a vehicle. I was just a, a man being used by God, but that I did have a special gift. I had a special connection with God where God felt comfortable, I guess, using me to deliver this healing power, okay. much like, you know, what we would say Jesus was doing. Mm. You know, Jesus was God's hands and feet, if you will, on the earth. Of course, I don't believe any of this anymore, but that's what we would teach. So was there a time, Timmy, where there was something going on in your church and maybe you hurt someone or you felt bad. Now you can look back and you feel bad about the way you treated them based on your religious beliefs. Yeah, very, very sad about this one. There was a, a gay couple in our church and they it just had become legal to get married here in Kansas. And they asked me to do their wedding for them. And I denied them and said, I, I can't do it. I can't condone your, your lifestyle. And so they found someone else to marry them. Uh, I've since reconciled with them and told them I was very lost at that time and, and didn't understand what I understand now. Hmm. And, but that's one of the, probably the biggest regret I have is turning away this couple that you know, I mean, now I, I realize there's nothing wrong with being gay. Uh, you know, just like there's nothing wrong with being heterosexual. I was born heterosexual. Many of my friends were born homosexual. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you know, I viewed homosexuality as sin and not an appropriate lifestyle. And so for me to do the ceremony would have been me condoning it. Um, and so I, I had to condemn it as a way of standing and staying true to my convictions at the time. Yeah. And so that's one of my biggest regrets. And I was really thankful and happy that 
I got to sit with them and, and apologize and tell them that I regretted it and wish I would have done the, the wedding. And, and you know, cause I do them now. I do same sex marriages now. Um, but at the time I didn't think it was right. Yeah. So I'm wondering because there's an actual scripture and you know, the Bible way better than I do. So I'm wondering if you can help me with this. I was told that there's a certain scripture that's talking about man should not lie with another man, but it's a mistranslation yeah. and it was actually talking about pedophilia. Is that yeah. like, so can you explain that to people? Cause I'm wondering there may be still people who are saying, well, the Bible does say it's a sin. So I'm curious from your perspective, being a preacher and now being out of it, what your interpretation is. Sure. Yes. And that is, that's where I've come to understand that teaching now. Uh, even though I don't look at the Bible as, as the word of God anyway, I look at it as men, specifically men wrote the Bible trying to answer the questions about life, who and what and where things they couldn't explain. And so this is just men's interpretation of what God is or who God is. So, so scripture to me doesn't have that same value, but as I became more liberal in my theology, I really began to study on this idea of homosexuality. And what, if, what, if, it was only seven verses. There's seven verses in the Bible that even address, uh, homosexuality. And yes, as I began to really study it and look into the, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew and all these different translations, I came to understand it as pedophilia, uh, an older man with a younger boy and that it wasn't even referring to an adult man making his own choice to be with another adult consenting adult of the same sex mm -hmm. that that wasn't what it was even referring to at all. Okay. So, but in that, in the world that I was in there, I, I literally just had a conversation with my son who's 23. He's like, I am, he's just kind of an agnostic, but he is visiting one of the members from my church that, that I pastored and, and they're out in California and my son called me yesterday distressed saying that they were really kind of preaching at him and, and telling him that it's not okay to be gay. My son's not gay, but my son has some gay friends, mm -hmm. but he, my son was saying that, yeah, well, I mean, just born that way. There's nothing wrong with it. And man, they, I was, I was pissed about it. To be honest, they were telling him that that's wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a sin. It's not right. It's not natural. It's a choice and you can mm -hmm. undo it and all this stuff. And so my son was calling me saying, Dad, what they're just I saying all them? these things. You know, what, what do I say? What, you know, what do you think? And, and I told him, you know, all the things that I think. And I said, Hey, listen, son, I said, you're not going to change their mind. They think they're right. They've bought into this mindset. So the best thing you can probably do is just keep your mouth shut, keep mm -hmm. your thoughts to yourself, you know, because he's getting ganged up, yeah. you know, and even the parents jumped in, which that really bothered me. Uh, cause it's one thing for him to be talking to other, 20 somethings about this stuff and you know, whatever. But when the parents get involved and they're trying to force this cultish, antiquated, outdated, bigoted viewpoint on my son. Yeah. It was very disconcerting to me. So I'm, you know, I'm very passionate about it at this point. And that's why, you know, I'm new to coming out, uh, on, and tell my story. Yeah. What is the book that says that in the Bible? Just for my own reference. Yeah, there, there's in, it's in Corinthians, um, but then also in Leviticus that a man should not lie with a man. Uh, but in the book of Corinthians, I'd have to look it up to find out where that verse is exactly. No, I was just wondering because that comes up frequently, especially when we do interviews with someone who's gay. And then some people in the comments are like, well, it is a sin. I'm like, mm. oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, I'm happy that you have since made amends and you've talked to that couple and, and you know, apologized for that. And also, so this happened while you were still a pastor though, right? So did you eventually start yeah. teaching that being gay was okay in the eyes of God? Yeah, that was, a, I would say, the last couple years of my um being a pastor, because I did a sermon series that I think is still out on the internet somewhere, but it was called God Loves Gays. And I, I, this was my coming out sermon when I left that evangelical, narrow minded, fundamental, you know, the Bible is literally true in every way. Yeah. I, 
I took that turn and became what they call more liberal in my, my theology. And this was the beginning of where I am today. Like this is what started my journey. And so I did this big sermon called God Loves Gays. And man, it didn't split my church, but it definitely, there was a mass exodus ah. uh, that, yeah, there was a, about 50 people that left our church and, you know, we're running about 300, 250 to 300. So 50 people leaving your church, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. But what was cool is on the back end, we had some more liberal Christians uh, so, you know, we had a, a LGBTQ spike up in our church, like some people were coming to our church. And so it, we really turned the corner becoming a more open minded church. But man, those fundamental people who are the ones that are giving, they're the ones supporting the church. They're the ones that want you to stay biblical, yeah. what they think is biblical, which is, again, such a farce. But so we were leaving the biblical teachings and again, it just caused a massive exodus out of our church. In fact, oddly, this family that my son is visiting, uh, they were one of the families that left when I did the God Loves Gays because they just, they couldn't accept that. They just didn't think that was in, in alignment with the word of God and, and what God wanted. That's and so, so, yeah. Even though you could say to them, this was a mistranslation and that's not what it meant. Yep, they didn't see it that way. That was a that was a definite detour from the evangelical fundamental viewpoint, which is a very specific. It's the word of God is literally true in every sense of the word. I, again, I don't believe this, but mm -hmm. it, it's true in every sense of the word. Every jot, every tittle, every comma. I mean, all of it is God's word. And it, it, it is good for reproof and doctrine and correction. And so they felt like I was just leaving that and it was bad. I got a lot of emails during that time from these people saying that I was dancing with the devil. Wow. <laughs> like I was literally, <laughs> I was holding hands with the devil because mm -hmm. we're the one true, right? We're the one true church. And so we were leaving the one true church by playing with this interpretation and changing the interpretation. I wonder if anyone from your church who heard that sermon actually, if you sent them into a faith crisis and also to a path of agnosticism without knowing it, wouldn't that be yeah, interesting well, to know? It, well, the, I did. So here's oh. what's wild. So I did this sermon. And there was a couple, a married couple, a man and a woman in my church at the time. And I don't know how else to say this, but you know, I had enough gay friends to, to recognize that he, he seemed gay to me. You know, it was just <laughs> a mixed extremely feminine. Marriage. Yeah. Very, ex very, very feminine. And, and just everything about him seemed gay. And at this point, you know, I had no problem with that, but he was married. So he was one of the ones that left the church, him and his wife left the church when I did the God Loves Gays. And he's one of the people that sent me an email that I had detoured from the, the word of God and all that. Fast forward from that time, maybe seven or eight years, I get another email from this guy. And he said, Timmy, you don't, you probably haven't followed my journey but I have since been divorced. I'm now partnered with a man. I'm living my true self. And you were the first person I thought of to email and tell you how much I appreciated your sermon. Goosebumps. And, but, but yet how much it bothered me as I, you know, he goes, as you remember, my wife and I left the church as a result of that teaching. He said, because it stirred us up so much and it made me realize something's different and that my sermon gave him proof kind of for him to start investigating like what is this right and so from from what he told me uh, from his from his email and i've since talked to him in person we've run into each other a couple times but it was an amicable divorce he just basically said hey listen i'm gay and uh which she was like well this explains <laughs> this explains so many things uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, yeah, now he's living his best life and him and his partner, I think, have since now married and they're they're doing great. That's 
so cool because in some ways you set people onto a path of their consciousness because like you said, you're preaching, we are the one true church and then you quote defect and now they're like, wait, I thought this was the one true church. What happened? Right. (laughs) And so interesting. Well, then the last question would be, not the last question, one of the last questions is, how did you get on this path of, okay, all of this is not true because you are so dedicated? That's such a slow journey from the God Loves Gays. I think that was like the beginning for me, the beginning of the end. The God Loves Gays journey began this, now I'm reading the Bible going, okay, well, if that doesn't mean what I thought it meant, what else in yeah. here means something else? And so then I, I gave myself permission to read things outside of my little echo chamber and and have conversations with other people. I, I remember calling up Jewish rabbis and saying, hey, can I take you to lunch? I want to ask you some questions. And so I would ask them about alcohol. Is alcohol a sin? And, and they're like, no, you know, Jesus turned water into wine. So all of a sudden I'm going from this, you know, very fundamental conservative evangelical pastor to a more liberal, open minded pastor who's now, you know, able to drink, able to smoke cigars and is cool with, you know, uh, doing gay marriages now. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm really beginning to open myself up. What I didn't realize is that it was going to really open myself up to, to really look at all of it and say, what really is true in here? And yeah. What makes sense? Because I believed that Jonah was swallowed by a fish, a big fish, and lived in the belly of that fish for three days until he agreed to go preach to the people in Nineveh. Like, I really believe that to be an actual factual story. I believe Jonah built an ark and two of every animal. Like, I believed all that stuff literally to be true. Mm-hmm. And now I'm realizing, wait a minute, those things are impossible. Like the sun can't stand still, like literally. (laughs) And so like that can't be true. And you can't live in the belly of a fish for three days. You can't build an ark single-handedly and have two of every creature and deal with feeding and all their poop and all like that. Like none of these things are making sense anymore. But the big thing for me, there was one conversation that I had with a neighbor. I'll never forget this conversation. They were evangelical Christian like me. They went to my church. They were definitely feeling uncomfortable with my new journey. And next door lived a Hindu family to me. And my son was real good friends with their son. And this family, I'll never forget this, came to me. They said, do you feel are you okay? Are you ever nervous about your son hanging out with this kid? His parents are Hindu, like they're committed Hindus. Like that could poison your son's faith. It could lead your son astray. Like, cause that's a false religion, right? Mm. Like you need to make sure. And I remember thinking to myself, is it though? Like, how do we know our religion is the true religion and theirs is false? Yeah. Maybe theirs is the true religion and what we're believing is false. And so in my mind, I was so kind of like offended by them saying that to me that it it pushed me even further away because I knew this person's life. You know, there, they, there were shenanigans. Like I knew this family. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There was more shenanigans. Like the cops were coming to their house more often than they were coming to my house, (laughs) you know, to deal with my teenage kids. So I knew that, that they were just being hypocritical. And I just began to become more critical of my own beliefs and of other people in the circle that I ran in and realizing, wait a minute, there's people in my church addicted to drugs, having affairs, doing this crazy stuff, living in ways that are not congruent with what I thought was what we were teaching. And then I'm meeting people from other faiths that technically, I mean, really, they're just better people. <laughs> like they, like this Hindu <laughs> family, they were just better people than we were. And I'm recognizing that, man, maybe I'm missing something here. And maybe who we are as people has nothing to do 
with our religion. Mm. And, and I had met some of my friends had become agnostic or even atheist. And I'm like, man, they're like really good people, very honest. And they're not Christian. How is this possible? Like, how can this family be so blessed and, and have good kids when they're not Christian? You know? Yeah. And, and this just, then it just started really unraveling, um, my everything, everything that I believed about everything became questionable. And this is then I had to close down the church. I remember just saying, Hey guys, I, I really don't, but I'm having a crisis of faith is how I worded it. I said, I'm having a real crisis of faith. And, and by this time, because my teaching had changed so much, you know, we went from 300 people, we were down to like 50 people. Um, and I just said, guys, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I don't know what I believe. Um, but this is clearly not what I believe. And I'm finding it harder and harder to teach the Bible with any kind of conviction right? because I'm just not seeing it as what I once did. And yeah. And so I, I'll never forget that last sermon. I just basically preached, listen, the only thing I can tell you is be a good person, be a good human and treat people kindly. And it's been a fun journey. And, you know, we'll, we'll stay in touch through Facebook maybe. And that was it. I love that what catalyzed everything was us versus them dissolving. Yes. So you're recognizing that there are good people outside of the quote, one true church. And I feel like that's what's missing in a lot of these cults because they intentionally keep them isolated so that they can't see outside for what it is. Yep. And being able to recognize the good in other people who believe differently is such a good quality to have because it really, you can't argue with that. Yeah. Like you can argue with scripture and translation and whatever, but you can't argue that's a good person over there yeah. and we believe differently, you know, unless you're really, really dedicated on just seeing faults in people, which is not a good way to live either, right. which also happens when you're in cults with this us versus them mentality is you're trained to see the bad in people yeah. so that you feel safe in your own little bubble. So I love that you just really took a good look at yourself and also others and were like, oh, there's there's a world out here that is not going up in flames and they're not led by the devil. They're good people. Right. That's great. Yeah. And they're being blessed. You know, and when I say blessed, I, it, it, that was my wording, but I'm like, yeah. you know, they have things going well for them. They're getting raises and bonuses and, and things are happening in their life that are what I would consider blessings of the Lord, sure. but yet they're not in with the Lord. So how are they so <laughs> blessed, you know? And again, earlier on, I would have, a, I would say that's the devil blessing them is what I would say. It's like the devil has their mind and the devil's keeping them by, by these monetary blessings, you know, but then uh, I just realized that's a crock of crap. That's not true. <laughs> you know, they're being blessed because they're just good people and they're honest and yeah. they have good principles that they're living out with finances. Apparently, you know, they're making good financial decisions, you know, and, and, and the blessing comes from that, not from giving to God or, living a godly life. That makes sense. So I guess my last question before we get into how you're doing now would be, it seems like you would have really done some good if you continued on the path of the progressive pastor as far as accepting LGBTQ people, as far as like, hey, you guys can drink if, you know, be good about it or like don't overindulge or whatever it is that yeah. you are inspiring people. You're definitely charismatic and you could make someone feel good after a Sunday lesson. Yeah. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts about pastors who continue down that path, even though they may not exactly think the Bible is literal? Do you think it's okay for people to go to churches like this and, and get that spiritual, I don't know, fill up their spiritual tank? Or do you feel like, if it's not resonating, you just need to get out of it. Yeah. So that's a great question. And because I've given that a lot of thought, like how damaging is it to be in a church community? Clearly, there are some church cultures that are way more culty and dangerous mm -hmm. and, and even harmful than others. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, 
the Methodist church down the street that's, you know, doing their thing and teaching certain things, you know, they're, they're not culty at all and maybe even slightly cult adjacent even. I, that's a good question. I'm not really sure how to answer. I think I don't view any of that. Te- like I don't view the Bible as the word of God. So I, I think just like any book, any book you could ever read where you glean some good things from it. Meaning. Yeah. Meaning. I think you could do the same thing with the Bible. You know, there are things in there that you can read it and, and pull some meaning out of it. Is that because what God wanted you to get? You know, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a, th- a matter of God giving you some meaning from his word. Uh, but it's just like any other book. So I'm, I, you know, I, let me just tell you my story. So I tried to continue to go to church in a mm-hmm. non evangelical, non kind of a church. In fact, it was a Methodist church that I was going to. And for me personally, I became so sensitive to when things were being said, like you draw close to God and God will bless you. And I would just be sitting in the church thinking, that's bullshit. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> you know, like that's not true. Um, or, or like your marriage, it, it, when you give your life to God, he'll bless your marriage. Well, that's just not true. Like be a good freaking husband. Like that's what yeah. makes a marriage great. You know, be a good wife, yeah. get, be a good person, be honest and open hearted and tender hearted towards your partner. Like all those things are what leads to a, a great marriage, not, not being committed to God. So for me personally, I, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't continue to go to church, even in a church that's doesn't have much cultiness in it. I found it not true. I just found the teaching just to be absolutely not true. And, and there is one scripture that I still really lean into today. It's, and then it's the scripture that the truth, uh, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so what I now, back then I viewed truth as the Bible. The Bible's truth. Yeah. Right. Now I understand. No, truth is truth. But what is actually factually true to know the actual factual truth will set you free because it's true, <laughs> you know? And so for me, the more I began to recognize the truth, what's factually actually true, like evolution and different things, as I really began to realize, oh, oh, now that makes so much sense. Now I can recognize and and reconcile bad things in the world or mm. children dying of cancer. I can, I can reconcile all that now. I could not at all reconcile that when I was believing that God was good and all powerful and all lo- loving and could do anything. Really? Then why isn't he healing the children and giving clean water to innocent people? I cannot, I could not. That was one of the big ticket items for me. I could not reconcile that. I could not mm-hmm. reconcile a good, loving God with sick, dying children. I was like, Mm-mm, I, I can't reconcile that. Well, now I can reconcile it because I don't believe in that God. And so now life makes way more sense to me. Um, again, and it set me free. And I can't mm-hmm. even tell you how burdened I was and, and conflicted and tormented even believing those certain things then and how free and at peace I am now. So yeah, I personally can't go to church. You know, I, I tried to even go stick with Christmas and Easter, like as a family event. And, yeah. and it was a couple of years ago that I, I went to one of those services and I just, I, I just found myself critiquing things that were said and thinking to myself, that's not true. That's not true. That that's literally <laughs> not true. And yeah. it just bothered me too bad. So, but I will say this, you know, blessings to the Christian that can live a normal, non weird, non goofy, non cultish kind of way and be open minded to other uh, Christians. And I have some people in my life that they would say they're Christian, but they also don't think that Christian is the only way. You know, they mm. think Hindus it's fine. You're Hindu. They even like, they're fine to say you're just spiritual. You're fine to say you're agnostic. You're fine to be atheist. 
that's rare. That was super mm-hmm. non-existent in how I grew up in the circle I ran in. But I guess there are some people who can even be okay with this conversation and be like, yeah, and wouldn't send me a, ha- a hateful comment that, you know, you've just been led astray and you never knew God and all that stuff. You know, anybody that says that kind of stuff, they've drank the Kool-Aid. They've just bought in, <laughs> you know, but, but there, I'm sure there's some Christians here that love your channel and they're loving what I'm saying. God bless those people. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's one of those things where we always say on this channel, whatever your consciousness looks like for you, like whatever your happiness, your awareness, your individual sovereignty looks like, that's great. If you're not hurting other people, if you feel like you're in complete control of your life, you don't feel manipulated or controlled or guilted into living a certain way, then more power to you. Believe whatever you'd like to believe. And so Amen. that's how we operate. Yeah. And I feel like there are people who do need that church atmosphere. They need the community. They Something in their life feels more full if they have the community of the church or if they have that message on Sunday that brings them peace or happiness in some way. And then other people like us or we walk into a church and we're like, oh, I can't stand it. Like they're just guilting people, you know, like we see it differently. And I think a lot of it has to do with how you internalize it because with us, we internalize it as they're trying to manipulate us into giving money or they're trying to manipulate us into um, a sex life that they think is holy and we are like, do whatever you want. So I feel like that's also a big part of it where if you're going to a church and you're not internalizing things in a way that's harmful and it feels good to you, then keep doing it. And then, but also knowing that if at some point it doesn't feel good, it's okay to walk away. I think that's the main thing. Like, Something can work for you, but it doesn't have to work forever. Yeah, I think the thing I, I was asked this recently, like, what do you miss from from mm-hmm. those days? And there there were two things primarily that I don't miss now, but as I was getting further and further to where I am today, the one thing, the big thing was the community. Like that's the piece that I get and I understand is for me, like I had to find a new community. Uh, a community that was safe for me to be me and to express myself fully how I am, uh, which for me just led to more and more tattoos, longer hair, and just a different vibe that I now have. Um, I just never felt fully free to, to be me. And so now I am, and I have my, uh, in my own community, I have people that I am in, in community with and see on regular basis. And the other big piece that I missed was the teaching preaching part. Now, not preaching mm. the, 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 the public speaking. Yeah. Uh, I missed that. And so that's why I started YouTubing. And I thought, you know what? I love talking clearly. And uh, <laughs> I, I love sharing my story. And I've just now felt comfortable doing that because it, it took me a while to really find my footing, if, if that makes sense. You know, I was so unsettled in, in that process of unwinding some things that I'm like, what do I believe? Like, you know, where am I in my, in my journey? And I realized life is a journey and it's continuous and you kind of always are learning and growing. But I was so <laughs> shaky there for those first couple of years, you know, like, am I just a real liberal Christian now? Or, you know, where am I? And, you know, looking at other religions and maybe I'm Buddhist. And, you know, so I started going to a Buddhist service and, and, you know, I was checking that out and, and, you know, finally it, it, it I just settled to where I am. And, and that's, I'm not really a part of any kind of at all spiritual organized community religion. like that. Yeah. Any kind of organized religion. And man, does it feel good. <laughs> <laughs> it feels good. And it feels really good to share my story and I, I said this the other day on my own podcast. I said, listen, I'm not trying to get any converts. I'm not saying if you're a Christian, like you do you, boo. Like mm-hmm. if it's working for you, stick with it. But I am sharing that, hey, it is okay to, to walk away if that's your struggle. And it is okay yeah. to not believe everything that you're hearing. Like it, it is okay. And, you know, the, I, I think that's why that first video that I really did that I started sharing a little bit about my journey and I haven't even done a full podcast where I share it yet. I mean, there was just, I don't know, I forget how many comments, but 500 comments of people sharing saying, 
yeah, yeah, I'm Christian, but I have a lot of questions. And these things that you're talking about are the things I've been questioning. And, and, you know, is it okay for me to question and, and wanting more of that? Just, I guess, a- affirmation or confirmation that, Hey, yeah, like it's totally okay. Yeah. And you do go through that. Whereas is, is God, am I, am I leaning into the voice of the devil? Like, is this the devil pulling me away or is this God? And, and just that whole journey again, till finally I realized it's, it's neither God nor the devil. It, it's just my own thoughts. It's my own in my own consciousness talking to itself. Mm-hmm. And that's normal. And it's, it's okay. It's okay to question and it's okay to leave if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm, you know, hoping that my message and my story just resonates with other people who might already be on the journey already. Yeah. And let's talk about what you're doing now, your consciousness side, what makes you happy and at peace and, and finding joy. Yeah. You know, being my true self, living my authentic life has been such a wonderful journey, allowing myself to, to, you know, drink if I want to smoke weed, if I want to, you know, get more tattoos if I want to. And I'm not I'm saying you got to do those things just for me. I was such a no drinker, no, no nothing. Mm-hmm. And to have the freedom and feel no judgment. It's weird. I, I was judging people so much and I was also judging myself and felt so judged. Now I'm out in the world. I'm like, you know what? A lot of people don't judge. Like I thought everybody judged because I was a judger. Uh-huh. And, and now just being able to have these open and honest conversations and, and, you know, doing weddings for same sex couples or doing, doing weddings for thruples, you know, doing oh, wow. weddings for <laughs> people that are in open marriages. Uh-huh. You know, I'm in a monogamous marriage, but like being open to like, Hey, listen, if it works for you. I like, Hey, I, I, you know, I had a couple very nervous. They're like, listen, we're, we're an open couple. And so we want to do a thruple kind of ceremony. Would you do that? I'm like, absolutely. I would do it. I don't have to be in that lifestyle to say, Hey, I'll, I would love to officiate your thruple marriage. Like if they, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that felt so good. It was almost like making me get over the, some of the, regret of things I didn't do and and people that I condemned and judged, you know, Mm -hmm. um, it, it feels good to now come around and be able to, to actively participate in, you know, the pride parade. We just had a big pride parade and it was great to be there and do it. You know, even I'm, even though I'm heterosexual, it's like, I can celebrate with my friends and, and it's, and I can, wear the rainbow stuff and, and be okay. And I don't care. Even if people thought I was gay, I don't care what you think of me. I don't (laughs) care about that. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? It's it's just, I have such a, I have such a freedom in life now that it's just such a joy to live open and honest and, and share my story by doing, you know, YouTubes and podcasts and, and, you know, some blogs and, and, uh, yeah, it's just refreshing. And you know, what I do for my day job is I'm in the wedding business. That's what I do. So I get to celebrate with all kinds of beautiful people, you know, on a big day in their life. And it's so fun. That's awesome. And you're, you're a relationship coach, right? Uh huh. Yep. I work as a matchmaker, relationship coach and a date coach. And yeah, I have some Facebook groups that, oh gosh, I mean, like 10,000 people in the group and, I throw out different ideas and videos on how to date, what apps are good or what I think is good, uh-huh. and, you know, just kind of giving them, you know, thoughts and ideas on, um, relationship stuff and how to date better. And it's been fun. Wow. So you're still a leader of sorts. You know, I, I am. <laughs> it, it took me, yeah, it took me probably three years of none of that, of, of pulling away and sitting on the sidelines, which, yeah, my personality type, that was difficult, you know, cause I'm just so <laughs> used to. Now I didn't pull away from weddings. I still was doing weddings, which gave me such peace. It, it was such a joy to feel valuable in a time where it was dark. I'll be honest. I mean, I went to therapy for a good year. Uh, uh, and I still will check in every once in a while just to, 
because it was dark. It was hard. I mean, I left the entire world that, that I was in mm -hmm. deeply that you were leading and as a, I was a, yeah, I was a leader in this world and to walk away from that community, from my friends, well, they, they walked away from me. I mean, I was still willing to be friends with people who were Christian, but they, they, they just couldn't, mm. you know, they just, they couldn't reconcile my walking away and it was dark. It, it got messy before it got pretty, uh, just in that journey of, of like the most happy free time of my life, but also like the darkest, saddest time of my life too, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I've been there. It's really confusing. The dichot dichotomy of it is like, I can do anything. Wait, I can do anything. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. I'm so happy that you're doing great now and you're sharing your story. People can find you over on YouTube, your channel, Timmy Gibson Casey. We'll put a link in the description as well as your Instagram under the same handle. So yeah, if anyone you. wants to reach out and and talk through some stuff. It seems like you're still a good person to go to for some advice, well, but now on the it. opposite side, right? Instead of like yeah. shaming them into something, it's like, hey, do you. <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, that's what I do now. Yeah. Now I'm just like, hey, search your own soul, dig in. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't try to say I have any answers, you know, but I can definitely encourage you to turn within for sure. Yeah. What a humbling experience going from I have all of the answers to you have the answers <laughs> that you just have to figure out on your own. Yeah. That's great. Well, let's do your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement as the viral video at the toddler goes, or something more on the inspirational lines. Don't be afraid to be your authentic self. Just live your authentic self. And I'm telling you, it's a very free place to be. Mm, absolutely. Linda Listen, live authentically. That's great. Well, thank you for coming on to me. Do you have any other final thoughts? This was great. No, I just, I really appreciate, um, your all show and goodness gracious. I, I am a new subscriber. I just subscribed. <laughs> Welcome. And, uh, in fact, I was checking out some videos this morning and I thought, gosh, I can't wait to dig into this, uh, and hear more of other people's stories of, of how they got out of cults, you know, full blown cults or cult adjacent mm -hmm. type church scenarios. So very, yeah, kudos to you guys. You guys are obviously doing a great job. Thank you. Clearly you can just tell by the channel and the quality of work you put out. So keep being you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to live my authentic self, Timmy. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty and being able to take accountability and say, hey, I was doing something and I was wrong and this is how I've changed and you can change too. I think that's really inspirational seeing how someone who was at the very top in sort in some ways can say, yeah. Hey, I was wrong and do a complete 180 and be on this side now. So we appreciate your honesty there. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So guys, if you're watching, leave those words of encouragement down below, or if you can relate in any way, we love to hear your stories in the comments too. There's such a great community here building each other up and being people being willing to share their own stories is great. So do that. And it also helps the algorithm get it to more people. That's the best way you can support us. But if you want to support further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. You can check out our merch at cults to consciousness.com under the merch tab. Our Costa Rica vacation is fully booked, but you can add yourself to the wait list if you want to be notified of future vacations. And that's it. If you like this video, I'll link two more down here below that you can check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. <laughs>